Hi and uh, welcome back to another uh, video feature of the Immersive Worlds Handbook. I am actually inside the uh, Seattle Public Library and I can show you the view down. It's not for the faint if you're afraid of heights. I'm picking that up. But I wanted to take you on a video tour of this um, innovative library. If you saw my uh, video a tour of the Cerritos Public Library in Southern California, this is a library that certainly rivals it um, in a much different sense. So as I take you on the tour, uh, be sure to do a little bit of a compare and contrast as you think about um, the differences in the library. So let's take a look at this amazing architectural feat here in Seattle and Washington. Okay, so we'll begin the uh, video tour today here in Seattle at the uh, Central Library. An amazing space, a space that's won uh, many architecture awards. Uh, built in 2007, uh, Rem Coolhouse, uh, among others, were involved in the architecture and design. Very conceptual space, as we'll be talking about today. Uh, some people hate this fact, uh, and, and uh, we'll discuss today why this library is seen uh, as um, inappropriate by, by some. And I think one of the reasons for this is it does ask the question, which we'll talk about extensively, what is a library? If our perception of a library is one thing, perhaps that has to be altered uh, by the time we uh, enter and exit uh, the library. Um, here's an image from some libraries I've experienced in the past. This is the Library of, of Congress, and I think the Library of Congress is an example of a space that has uh, the traditional notions of a library, right? How it's organized, um, your sensory experiences while within it. It's a very hollowed, sacred space of, um, you know, working quietly with books. Uh, the stock footage, you know, suggests often what libraries are like, right? They're very flat spaces. They're horizontally inclined. Uh, one moves through the stacks in a very cloistered, uh, monk-like setting or sense. Uh, this is the British Library. And um, similar, although there is, uh, you know, some play with um, exhibits and our perceptions of books. And then at the British Museum, where Marx famously wrote some of the Communist Manifesto, you see also this approach where the books almost have this very sacred sensibility about them. Going back to Seattle here in the library, there's a much different project at play. And that's really why I wanted to focus on this famous and infamous library that uh, uh, we could look at today. Now, in asking this question, what is the library? If we go to other spaces, interestingly enough, like here the Bikini Berlin, which turns the notion of the shopping mall on its head, we are allowed to ask the question, in this case, what is a shopping mall? And so I challenge you a little bit in this video if you have the perception that we shouldn't be asking this question, uh, why are we allowed to ask it in other spaces, in other contexts, particularly in consumer contexts? Looking now at the Cerritos Library, if you saw my video on this library, there's also a play here on this questioning of what a library is. Now Cerritos, I think, takes a different approach. They base their fundamental conceptual principles on ideals from Pine and Gilmore's The Experience Economy. And uh, in that particular book, of course, the, the, the focus is talking about experiences. And uh, so I think what's going on at the Seattle version of this is much more conceptual and much less thematic. So as I take you through the spaces of the Seattle Library, um, talking about how I think it classifies as a postmodern library, I wanted to focus on five uh, main areas. The first one we looked at, I would suggest the postmodern library asks the question, what is a library? Secondly, the library alters um, our perception of space and how space is used within it. Third, there's an experimentation with form and function. When I talk about this today, I do not um, intend these to be dichotomous. I think there's an interplay between form and function in any space, particularly in this space designed by Kulhaas, Bruce Mao, and many others. Uh, fourth, there's an altering of our perception and experiences. So if we think, as I talked about earlier, that we should go and uh, walk through dusty book stacks and have a very monk-like cloistered experience, uh, that will be altered as we move through this library and postmodern libraries in general. Then lastly, very controversial, makes us think beyond books. If our perception is that all libraries should be like the great Library of Alexandria and be about the sacred space of books and archives, um, this library and the postmodern library in general will make us think beyond books. And this will end our uh, considerations today with this very controversial notion indeed. 
So we'll try to keep these questions in mind then, or these issues in mind, as we consider how this library fulfills what uh, might be called a, a postmodern approach to both space and context or information practices for the guest. So, you know, when you first see the library, you're struck by the exterior architecture. Um, on the interior, well, for me, one of the most striking things was the escalators. Um, again, we're not looking at books here. You'll see some shots of the stacks which we'll discover later meander uh, through the various floors, so a much different approach to the, to the Dewey Decimal System. Um, but, you know, these escalators are a striking feature, and um, a little bit of text here and also color, I think, achieves a, a pretty remarkable design. Um, you wouldn't necessarily think of escalators being a central feature of a library, but it's another way that I think this library will suggest to us a, a liminal uh, movement through passageways and thresholds and the like. Um, so the next area we should uh, talk about is this idea of the postmodern library experimenting with form and function. I've suggested earlier that we shouldn't think of one being um, separate from the other. I think often we think of these as being dichotomous, so we have to design our uh, space in such a way such that it's functional it provides certain things for the guests. I think there's a play here at um, the library here in Seattle in terms of what form and function can do together. So one of the clear things that you get is this sensibility of a, a postmodern approach to architecture and spatial design. Um, I will read you a series of uh, quotations of Kohlhaas throughout this uh, video today to give you a sensibility about the conceptual approach behind this library. Uh, I encourage you to uh, search widely beyond this video, uh, Google the architectural firm, Google the library itself, and you will find um, a, a plethora of information about the approach to the design, to the architecture, and so forth, and fascinating stuff to uh, take a look at. I will take you through a series of um, additional videos here of the escalators and this could get very boring very quickly but I was fascinated with just how they approach the uh, layout of, of the space. Um, I, I think Kohlhaas used the word um, interstitial which suggests this movement between spaces and you do get this overwhelming sensibility as you travel through the library. Um, you almost get a sense of being lost and perhaps this is one of the reasons that critics do not, some critics I should say, do not like this library. Um, there isn't a clear approach to saying, okay, on the second floor you're going to find these books or on the second floor you'll find this space. I'll show you later some of the uh, uh, maps that um, orient the guests in space which were designed by Bruce Mao, the design firm. Um, those do in a sense tell you that you can find the red room on this floor, you can find uh, the mixing chamber on this floor. But as you move through this library, you do get this disorienting sense, I think. And and to me, it's a profound one. To me, it, it challenges my perception of what a library should be. And hopefully, if you visit it or plan to visit, um, it will also challenge your perception of a library. And I think that's a great thing in today's day and age of... Um, uh, you know, rather dull spaces. And, and so it's an opportunity, I think, to think about the library in a much different sense. Um, just on the right here, I will show you coming up. Um, a lot of times I'm shooting video, I'm not sure what I'm going to need later, so I'm slowing this down. It's a blip blur, bit blurry. But one of the points about this space is how they approach the um, book spiral. So they're, they're looking at this as a movement through the various floors. Uh, you see um, a really great map here that shows you the different levels. So the book spiral includes levels 9, 8, 7, and 6. They talk about the architecture. Um, they talk about um, you know some of the floors, what's on them. We will look at the red floor uh, on level floor, or level, f level 4, sorry. Um, and then uh, level 5, we'll, we'll talk about the uh, mixing chamber and how they were trying to deliberately redesign the idea of the reference desk. You know, so the old timey notion of the library, every traditional sense, whether it's space, information design, the layout of the books, the Dewey Decimal System, all that is thrown out. And, and you get this immediate sense, right? You see the library from either 4th or 5th Street. And you know something different is going on here. You're not going to walk in and see traditional stacks. You're not going to walk in and see a reference desk right as you enter the library. And that, by the way, is a profound play with um, form and function itself. The fact that the reference desk is not, uh, you know, 
right at the entrance when we enter. Again, this is not the kind of library we're thinking about here, the old time library, when we're entering this space in Seattle. And then, let me then read you a quote by Rem Koolhaas, which I think defines this new approach to the space of the stacks. He says here, there is a kind of sadness about the traditional multi-storied library. It is simply divided into floors, and each floor is more or less a random grouping of subjects, like humanities, whatever. We wanted to have a single, continuous experience, making individual floors almost mute, and that's why we came up with a spiral. And thinking about that quote um, a little more fully, we can look at a more footage of the stacks. This is a shot with a Blackmagic uh, design pocket cinema camera. And, um, you know, again, you see this meandering of the space. And this is why I think form and function work together. So the space itself is having an effect on us. And then the information, the design, how the stacks are arranged, as we'll see later with the mixing chamber slash old time reference desk. Um, these are both functioning together, right? They are operating together in this organic sense. I think they're both operating in a clearly postmodern sense. For, tra tra for traditional folks, as we'll talk about later, um, this is not a good thing necessarily. Uh, for someone like me who studied these, these spaces and spends a lot of time in libraries, I find it fascinating. I find it absolutely marvelous. And it's uh, one of the reasons I chose this for my uh, futures um, video uh, space features, because I think this is an example of where libraries and other spaces might be headed in the future. Well, let's look at another feature of the postmodern library, and this is related to the last. It's altering the space of the library. And a lot of these, of course, go together, but I wanted to specifically focus on the spatial layout of the library because there's just so much to take in here that is so different. I mean, you can spend, as I did, and I spent two hours or so, very quick uh, trip here in Seattle through the library. I actually need to go back for sure. But you can spend uh, hours here just looking at the architecture, just looking at some of these great vistas and views outside the windows. I mean, it's such a remarkable feat, I think, what they achieved here. Uh, I showed you so much of uh, the escalators. And again, I feel like the escalators are a clear example of connecting these spaces, of um, propelling the guests through thresholds, of creating senses of, of liminality, of experiences of being betwixt and between. So these are actually, to reiterate, a key aspect of the spatial design. Now here's another aspect. You look at some of these spaces that just open up, right? They're very enveloping. You get this sense of a flow between one and the next, right? You could have a traditional roof right there cutting off the space. We can see all the way to the bottom. This is looking down almost 10 floors all the way to the bottom. It actually made me a little queasy, um, but this is a much different approach to the design of, tr of a traditional library. Um, in some senses, it actually reminds me of the void spaces of a different architect of Liebeskind's um, Jewish Museum in Berlin in a much, much different context. But this open space here uh, it serves such an, I think, interesting purpose in terms of creating um, new perceptions of what uh, a library should look like, how we um, interact with it, what we feel when we move through the library. These are quite remarkable as well. Um, up here on the 10th floor, there are some amazing uh, views, and I, I took some uh, images here, but you just get this, this dramatic sense of the city. Now, later in the video, I'll talk about a criticism that the library is deliberately shut off from the hustle and bustle of the city. And maybe this challenges that, right? You can see a lot of the city um, from uh, this uh, vantage point. You see the skyscrapers, as we saw earlier, you see the spaces below, the streets, the cars, the pedestrians. So it's, a, I think, a quite remarkable approach to uh, a spatial design of a library. You see a sign here, you're at the highest uh, viewpoint. And I showed you earlier that um, atrium outlook, which is quite dramatic. You see spaces like this as you walk through the library. You actually do get lost. At one point, I was trying to make my way around the escalators and the elevators, and I was just like, okay, where do, where do I go to next, right? Uh, you see that um, example there of the Dewey Decimal System, the stacks that we talked about earlier. That's a really good shot of it. And here are um, two statements from the architect that I think clearly express what was going on here in terms of the spatial organization? Here's the first one. Instead of its current ambiguous flexibility, the library could cultivate a more refined approach by organizing itself into spatial compartments, each dedicated to and equipped for specific duties. 
Tailored flexibility remains possible within each compartment, but without the threat of one section hindering the others. Here's the second quote. The problem of traditional library organization is flatness. Departments are organized according to floor plans. Each floor is discrete. The unpredictable fits of growth and contraction in certain sections are theoretically contained within a single floor. And then keeping that, uh, those quotations in mind, we can look uh, a little more here at the, the spatial layout. Again, what I like here is just this um, open approach where one um, department or area of the library opens into the next. There isn't this segmenting off. And look, you see these incredible views there. I, I think there is an openness here to the city, challenging what some of the critics say. Look at this view here. Just quite amazing. The architecture, we see just the, the, the open design here. The fact that there is a, a sense of dialogue, I would almost say metaphorically, between the various spaces here, between the departments. You see the map room, uh, some of the stacks. Uh, here is um, one of the uh, uh, bit of the signage here that shows you where to find um, some of the spaces. Again, of rather disorienting. Uh, Bruce Mao Design did um, a lot of the uh, typography, the signage, the uh, the big um, uh, fonts that you see, like here, uh, indicating a living room at level three. So I think it's a it, it's another effective um, use in this case of of signage and um, typography to establish um, just a more postmodern sense. Um, it, it, it gives it a design sensibility, I think, to this library, which is often lacking in a lot of libraries. If you see my video in the Cerritos Library, I make some of the same points that they're seriously thinking about design and experience. And for some people, this will not be uh, a nice thing because they don't want a library to be like this, right? I mean, you even look at this um, map here of the various uh, floors of the library and you get a sense that something dramatic is going on here in terms of uh, what the guest is experiencing. Now here's another sign of something dramatic. This is a bit of an art feature. There was a little bit of sound but it didn't come out so great so I turned it down. That's as you're going up the escalator. And so, uh, you know, that itself is, is something quite different you would say in terms of thinking about the traditional library. I think I'll have a shot here in a second of the reverse side. So this is from the uh, red floor, the red room. Um, you see actually the behind, uh, uh, the back side of that moving sculpture that we just uh, took a look at. So again, it gives you a sense that something entirely different is happening in the space in terms of space, form and function, uh, the experience that, that the guest has. So it's, it's quite a different approach to uh, I think anything we've ever seen in, in the past in terms of libraries. And this actually segues quite nicely into my next focus and I would suggest to you that the postmodern library in many ways alters our perceptions and our experiences. What we have of a library, how we think we should interact with it, whether it's its, its spaces, its information, context, and the like. So as we think about the alteration of our perception and experience today, let's keep in mind the other um, characteristics we've already talked about, including space and the blurring of form and function. These next two um, slides are from the library itself, and this highlights some of my focus on, on combining these all together. You see right here with this map um, how the escalators are laid out, the elevator, the book spiral. This does disorient our perception of what a library is, right? We are moving through the floors. There's much more a sense of connection between the spaces than the stairwell, the traditional stairwell that delineates a library floor from the next. This is um, from the self-guided tour of the Central Library's key attractions, um, actually referencing the um, uh, escalators and elevators being green-yellow. Uh, the explanation here is that it's used to draw your eye to the ways you can move throughout the building, which I would say it's more than that. I think there's something going on conceptual in terms of creating these uh, liminal uh, sensibilities that we might have as we move throughout the library. And then back on the top, the question and the answer as to why the hallways are red. Uh, in a building of steel and glass and angles, the meeting room floor is an area meant for interactions between people. The intensely red corridors provide a vibrant link to the meeting rooms, which are painted cooler colors of gray, blue, white, and brown. Um, I didn't get any uh, photos or video of that, but let me take you now through some of the... Uh, I've heard this referred to as the red hall, the red room, the red floor. 
so the red area let's say um, but you know one of the things you notice here and this is never um, a consideration in design but I could not get any good photography or video just because of the reflections of the of the lights and uh, I, I've noticed this Atlas Obscura did a, a piece on just the red floor of the library same thing not very good photos so um, a cool space but in terms of the lighting um, I, I don't know I, you know I, it just it had this um, sense of feeling maybe a, a bit too much now I did like some of the transparency effects that we just saw there I just passed through this a couple times hoping on each pass through I would get better video or um, still shots indeed I didn't so but very cool you never see something like this um, in uh, a library space you almost think of something like a uh, Rothko Chapel in Houston or something like this so here's some of my on-site commentary so here's Red room, so it's harder to get focus here because of all the reflections and the effect of the, uh, the color here. Just a little cool space. And you can see some of the transparency effects back here. And let's go this way. Okay, this is a really good, um, we're on the fifth floor, so this looks to be the uh, fourth or third floor. And leaving that video, you can actually see here um, in a second, I guess I get a little more of the shot looking down below, but um, if you look at this image, that's from the other um, side. So you can actually see the red glow there and you see that transparent curtain effect. I absolutely love this design feature, I have to say. I think it's quite remarkable. Um, you know, in, in fact, the transparency effect you get here and also with the um, the street uh, views uh, through the windows and the skyscraper views, I think will challenge some of those criticisms that suggest the library is, is closed off. I also read another criticism that says Kohlhaas and the design team, the architects, weren't critical and reflexive. I think they're being very reflexive, at least in the way that I uh, perceive the space itself. You never get a sense that any given arena or, or zone of the library is finished. I feel like it flows into the next space there's always a sense of citation of another space, of another information context, of another room or uh, component of the library. So I view it in a much different sense. Again, I think our perception, our experiences, our challenge because of what is happening in terms of the, uh, the spatial design. Uh, now we're looking at uh, another shot here, uh, which draws attention to the fact that you're at a very high viewpoint. Um, and I think that itself reminds me of this next uh, feature of a postmodern library. You'll see this with the Cerritos Library as well in Southern California. The postmodern library makes us think beyond books themselves. So this is quite ironic. Again, you might think a library should be like um, the Library of Congress. The library should be something that is um, very significant, important. The Library of Congress, just given the fact that I, I spent um, a couple months working there many years ago um, on a research project, you know, you can't even access the stacks. Someone gets the books for you and there's an incredibly uh, complex, you know, conveyor system that uh, is used to, to bring the books. Uh, so, you know, it's a much different sense, I think, of how you think about books in that library and how you think about space and your interaction with the books and the information itself. And so as we're thinking beyond the books, I think the comparison with the Cerritos Library is key. Again, I would suggest to you both of these libraries have a postmodern approach. Now Cerritos on the right has a more thematic approach based on principles of uh, Pine and Gilmore's um, experience economy. And um, the library picture on the left, of course, the Seattle Library, is more conceptual, more, I would say even more postmodern, and it's based more on architectural theory that of Coolhouse and others, and also I think based on new principles in terms of how librarians and those involved in information sciences think about presenting information to the guests. Both of these libraries, I would suggest to you, play off the idea that a library has to be more than what it was in the past. It has to be more than books. It has to be more than the patron meandering through the stacks. There has to be something else going on because we live in a different age. And this is why I believe both of these libraries could be 
uh, um, placed within the context of this futures feature of the Immersive Worlds Handbook because both suggest a new direction for it. They're not um, comfortable with the idea of the traditional library. So it's something for us to think about in terms of the future of spaces like these. And I think in getting us to think beyond the library itself and beyond the book itself, you have a shot here. I slowed it down. Again, I didn't get a lot of footage. This is what they call the mixing chamber as opposed to the reference desk. Um, and, you know, it, it suggests an entirely new way of approaching the library. Um, this library, along with the Cerritos version, suggests to us uh, beyond books, we have to think about all the context of information out there available to a patron or guest of a library space. And here is an important um, quotation from Kuhlhaas that explains this shift from the reference desk to the mixing chamber. He says, we were just interested to reinvent the vocabulary so it would not be conveying this kind of endless tradition that was running to its conclusion. If you mention in one sentence reference desk and mixing chamber, the one sounds uninspiring and the other sounds as if something is about to happen. And I think this highlights something I talked about earlier in form and function. Again, I was suggesting we shouldn't just think of one or the other in this dichotomous sense. What I feel is really key in that last quote by Kuhlhaus, and if you know his work, he's incredibly conceptual, incredibly brilliant. Um, I feel like, like what's going on here is there's a paralleling of the conceptual side of things, in other words, defining how does a patron use information? How does he or she interact with the stacks, with digital information, with archival materials? So that's the contextual, informational context. This is paralleled with the spatial context. So you look at images like these here, we feel liminality. We feel senses of wombs. We sen feel senses of being betwixt and between spaces. We can never in this library clearly define one, uh, even a threshold. We can't clearly state we're in one space versus the next. And I feel that this is the state of information today in a very postmodern sense. In the age of the Trump presidency, we're often asking things about fake news and thinking about what really is reality, what is perception, how can we ascertain the veracity of, of information. In some cases, we can't. And I feel as if this is an incredible paralleling of the spatial components of this library and the contextual, informational, and conceptual components of this library. And we will then return to our initial question. Um, again, I'm suggesting to you today that the postmodern library asks the question rather boldly, what is a library? Um, and no clearer explanation than uh, this next one, I think, is from Rem Koolhaas, who defines this project. He said the Seattle Central Library redefines the library as an institution no longer exclusively dedicated to the book, but as an information store where all potent forms of media, new and old, are presented equally and legibly. In an age where information can be accessed anywhere, it is the simultaneity of all media and, more importantly, the curatorship of their content that will make the library vital. So this, I think, is a rather radical statement. You get a radical conceptual statement here that defines this library. There's a spatial play on asking the question, what is a library? And there is a contextual, informational, conceptual play on this same question, what is a library? I think the Cerritos Library struggled with the same issue, and they approach it as I've suggested in a much different sense, a more thematic sense, whereas here in Seattle, with Cool House, with Bruce Mao and others involved, it's a conceptual approach to asking this question, what is the library? Clearly, both the Cerritos Library and the Seattle Central Public Library are quite comfortable in asking this question and indeed answering it not just inspiring us to think about a library in a different sense, but forcing us to do so. And again, this is, I think, what's led to so many people being critical of this library, as well as the Cerritos Library, because for some, it's an uncomfortable state of being to be in, to say, this library is no longer what you thought it was. We're redefining for you the space, the context, the concept of what a library is. Now again, as we uh, talked about at the beginning of the video, 
Many people will not be happy with this conceptual play with the library. I think some people are quite comfortable with the attitude that a library is a very staid place, dusty books, endless bookshelves, and there, there isn't anything conceptual going on. There isn't anything going on experientially or any plays with space organization or whatever. And this um, actually was identified by some critics. I found an article uh, by Lawrence uh, Cheek uh, in 2007, writing basically an architectural piece, and was very critical of the library. Spoke of it being confusing, impersonal, uncomfortable, oppressive, um, unpleasant features, monotonous, bad designs, cheesy details, dreary and depressing, cheaply uh, finished, dysfunctional, um, and apparently earlier he had praised the building and then um, actually critiqued it later. There was also a, um, uh, a criticism by the uh, Project for Public Spaces and talked about the fact that there is a sealing off of the space from the community. A library in their minds should be a community hub and due to the design of this library there is a removal from the vitality, if you will, of the community. And this, I think, is probably a fairly valid critique. I mean, if you walk in and out of the library, you do feel like you're totally sealed off from the city. A completely different experience, say, as compared to uh, Pike's Market, the Gum Wall, that area of town about nine blocks uh, down towards the water. Now, again, th this is a matter of perception. It's a very subjective opinion. Uh, what should the library be? Should the library be a vital community space? Or in some sense, should it try metaphorically to seal itself off from the community in some senses, interestingly enough, perhaps to allow people to really invest themselves in other worlds. If you're reading a book in the library, do you really want to be connected to the hustle and bustle, the vitality of the uh, Seattle metropolitan area? Perhaps you don't. Um, ultimately, I think a lot of this is in the eye of the beholder. And, and, it, and perhaps that sounds like a very easy way out, but um, there is no one view of what a library should be. There is no one perception of how it should look, of how it should be used, of all the contextual and informational issues that folks who have masters and PhDs in library sciences uh, debate all the time. But it's an important dialogue to begin here to ask some of these insignificant questions about indeed what is a library should it be postmodern? Should it reflect the various issues that I've talked about today? I hope you'll be inspired to consider some of these questions as you think about libraries, their designs, their informational approaches into the future.